it can help you to save a lot of time and heartache if you if because otherwise without that consciousness of values yeah. then they are susceptible to mimetic desire which is mm. um what does that we, mean mimetic desire is um when we are observing others enjoying mm, certain keeping things, up with the joneses maybe and then we believe that if we also have that thing yeah. That will make us happy. Yeah. So this Young is, financial advisors are experiencing that, I think. Yeah. Well, social media is yes. making this problem a whole lot worse in our yeah. world. There's a lot of yeah. memes on social media. <laughs> yeah. So um, it is well worth the time and effort to kind of explore it. And let me say, it's actually quite fun for people to do too. Yeah. It's an enjoyable experience. This happens to be the area that I think advisors are most nervous about. Ah. Welcome to AFO Wealth Management Forward, a podcast powered by Arrowroot Family Office that's at the intersection of accounting, wealth management, behavioral finance, technology, and entrepreneurship. We help accounting firms and financial advisors grow their practice by going beyond the numbers as we learn from industry leaders and subject matter experts to discover the secret to their success. A podcast that highlights everything from the transformative power of AI to embracing the human-first approach of behavioral finance to help you understand the psychological and emotional relationships to money and meaning. Here is your host, Rory Henry, director at Arrowroot Family Office and author of Holistic Guide to Wealth Management. All right. Hello, everyone. I am again joined by my guest co-host, Julie Johnson. Hello. Julie, how are we doing on this Friday? Fabulous. Super excited. So many great things going on. Yes. We're going to be talking about a lot of that today. So yay. Yes, we are. I'm super excited to introduce our next guest. She is a certified financial planner and president of Money Quotient, which is on a mission to facilitate the exploration and implementation of values-based and life-centered approach to financial planning. She's also a speaker, researcher, and teacher who geeks out on behavioral finance, <laughs> neuroscience, uh, communication, and in self self improvement and food as well. Yes, <laughs> I got I that right for a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> love it. So, without further ado, let me introduce our guest, Amy Mullen. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, I want to start out and ask about money quotient and behavioral finance, but first, I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite food? Oh my God. Uh, that's like an impossible question to answer. Because <laughs> I just love all food. And one of my favorite things to do when I go and visit a new city is to see if they have any food tours. Ooh. Food tours are like wow. the best way to learn about a new city because they also tend to it's give true. you like history of the city. And then you get to taste like some of the best <laughs> foods in the area too. Yes. And it's probably yeah. the off the beaten path you know, yeah. places too. Yeah. That's so cool. It's my favorite thing. For yeah. Sure. I have a friend who is a pretty high up Hollywood exec and he has an idea for a platform that goes to, uh, has celebrities talk about different food places that they like. And then he kind of went on and said, well, we can kind of give the locals there the opportunity to tell people who are visiting about those secret spots, those secret food spots that, that, that are best to visit in those cities. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah it sounds like a dream job for me like <laughs> if anybody ever asked me if I came back in another life what would my dream job be it would basically be what <laughs> Phil what's his name Phil Rosenberg somebody would <laughs> be Phil uh that would be yes my yeah like a global <laughs> food critic yeah global exactly food critic. <laughs> I love it I love it all right well let's get started here can you give our audience a little bit of background um, you know, explain what you do at, at Money Quotient and what led you into this behavioral finance world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Money Quotient has been around since 2001. Uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s was really kind of the birth of this life planning type movement. And it was super controversial back then, yeah. <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, people just still is feel, to some yeah, degree, right? Well, it's getting a little getting bit better. more accepted these Thank days. God. I feel like we are, <laughs> we are in a little bit of a bubble of people who, who believe <laughs> yeah. in it. And so I have to remind myself sometimes that, uh, you know, the majority of the industry is still not on board with this approach to financial planning. Um, but 
but I feel pretty lucky that I get mm-hmm. to work with like-minded professionals all the time. Uh, and and that, if I may interject, so rudely, yeah. sorry. <laughs> opportunity, right? There's so much opportunity. So sorry. There's a lot to that. There's a lot that needs to be learned, you know, and a lot of evolving to do. And I think that that's probably what keeps me so interested and passionate about this work is one, it's never ending when Mm -hmm. you're talking about what you can learn about human behavior, how to more effectively communicate to get positive results healthy financial behaviors, all of that is just fascinating and it's never ending, but also ever evolving. Yeah, always. I mean, new research coming out all the time, which um, (laughs) we get really involved in as well. Uh, But it also excites me to have this idea that, that we could at Money Quotient be a part of the evolution of this profession and like really make an impact in people's lives. And so, you know, all of that has kept me pretty dialed in for the last 23 years. Um, So yeah, we are a research and evidence-based uh, organization. We actually have two sister organizations, Money Quotient Inc., where we teach the model that we've developed. It's a very practical process that any advisor at any stage of their career can implement with their clients to help them uncover their core values, design a life that's going to be fulfilling. That boils down to some very specific goals that become part of the financial plan. Um, So we teach this model that's a multidisciplinary and research-based model on our Money Quotient Inc. side. And then we have MQ Research and Education, which is a 501c3 organization where we collaborate with uh, various universities and Um, other organizations to conduct research. Are you an accountant looking to generate more revenue and secure your future success as automation and artificial intelligence revolutionize the accounting profession? If so, contact us at AFO Wealth Management Forward. We specialize in helping accountants and advisors just like you build a custom brand to pinpoint your optimal clientele, generate highly qualified leads through our data-driven digital marketing, and execute wealth management growth services to bring more value to your firm and your client's life. Our strategic approach to branding, marketing, and wealth management is carefully tailored to attract ideal clients, increase customer retention rates, and cultivate lasting relationships with clients across generations. Visit wealthmanagementforward.com to book your free consultation to find out how you can elevate your practice. Which the results of that research Hmm. then get implemented into our trainings and You know, we develop a lot of like practical, applicable materials based on the research that we we get to, you know, the whole goal is to really make an impact in the consumer's lives and help adopt healthy financial behaviors, experience higher levels of well-being. You know, all of this is just to get as best results as possible. Yeah. Sounds like a dream job. (laughs) Speaking about getting best results here, Amy, I know you have some latest research that had some rather interesting findings on what advisors thought they were getting across the clients and what the clients were actually receiving. Can you talk about those latest findings? Yeah, um, it was pretty surprising. And I am trying to kind of spread the word because I think the results of the research are really pointing to the importance of having ongoing discovery with your mm. clients, not just in year one, but uh, revisiting and and seeing how various experiences like going through the pandemic, yeah. how that has shifted um, our clients' uh, perspectives, really everybody's perspectives. Um, and and how that has maybe changed what their priorities are and and frankly their values it has changed their values so um basically uh so Carol Anderson is my mother and she's the founder of money quotient she is the one that leads a lot of this research and she collaborated 
in 2021 um, with uh, uh, people at Kansas State University and to conduct this training, or sorry, training to conduct this research. research. And uh, this was sponsored by FPA as well as Allianz. Um, they put in the seed money for this research, but basically what it was looking at a number of different factors. They wanted to look at does um, the factors that contribute to trust and commitment with, mm -hmm. a, with an advisor, do those change over time? And are they affected by various things like the pandemic, pandemic. global events? Um, are they affected by things like virtual meetings that we now all have thanks to the pandemic? And um, is trust and commitment affected by the financial anxiety that the client is feeling, uh, regardless of what the advisor has done in terms of services for them? And then also, how does cultural awareness come into play mm. with that client's um, trust and commitment for their advisor? So it was across the board, really interesting and uh, really surprising results. Um, so I will say, I'll give you some kind of high level, yeah. high level outcomes. Um, but for anybody who is an FPA member, when you go into, you can log into whatever your account is and go to the research section and you can see the whole uh, white paper, which is pretty wow. extensive. Um, and so that's free and available to anybody who's an FPA member. Uh, it's called, the the study was called Developing and Maintaining Client trust and commitment in a rapidly changing environment. Mm. So essentially um, what we found was when, when advisors and clients were asked uh, like, how much does your planner know about your values, about your personal needs and priorities, about how frequently do they, um, reconnect with you and ask you about how things have changed and how that may have changed your priorities. You know, what do they know about these qualitative kind of parts of, of the relationship? And across the board with all of these different factors, um, the advisors were fairly confident <laughs> that they could <laughs> see things about their clients. So we were seeing like you know, in the, the mid to upper 80s and lower 90 percentile wise of advisors saying, yes, I know these things. I feel mm -hmm. confident that I know these things about my um, clients. The clients, however, were in like the 40s and even sometimes dipped mm -hmm. into the 30 percentiles. It was all basically under 50 percent who felt mm -hmm. that their advisor. So it was a pretty big gap between the client's perspectives and the advisor's perspectives. And there's there's a lot of um, hypotheses about what, what may have caused this, because I will say um, we did ask the same questions in another research project back in 2006, mm -hmm. um, you know, before the recession, yeah. before the pandemic, before some of these kind of major things that we've been living through. And clients were like right aligned with their advisor's perspectives. So they were like, yes, my advisor knows this about me. The percent, the percentages were, were right aligned with each other. Mm. Now, all of a sudden there's this big gap. Huge gap. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, so is it, so I hear, you know, recession and obviously COVID and everything else. Could it also be aligned with the evolving, if you will, demographic of investors? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's something that's important to take a look at. So who were the people who were, you know, answering out surveys, yeah. right? Who are the people who are filling out surveys? So in any sort of research project, there's always going to be a, you know this, Julie, but in every research project, um, 
in in like the conclusions, the summary, they're they're always going to remark on what did this study not tell us, and yeah. what more is it? You know, what more is out there that we need to explore? Because no research project is perfect. You you get the data, you you analyze the data. Um, you may not have had you know the 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 range of your the demographics of your um, people that you're surveying uh, may not be as perfect as you want it to, sure. but you collect whatever data that you can, you do the analysis, you put out, you know, some conclusions and you always talk about what more needs be to yeah. be explored. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called research. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You've love got that. to redo it Three. all the time. So there's an R and E in there. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of reasons why, why we could be seeing that. And yes, the demographics, um, actually the median age of the people who were studied in 2021 versus 20, 2006 Six. skewed lower. So they were, the median age was younger than the first round, which could tell us, I mean, that's right off the bat, there's differences in generations. Yeah. So younger generations are feel more strongly that they want to be personally known, yeah. right? Their personal goals are very important to them. They want to base things off of their values. They're, they have kind of a, a different perspective, this generation, but it's not, you know, they were not the only people who were surveyed. Sure. So it, it was, um, they did have a range in terms of the demographic there. But the, another thing I think that, uh, well, the, the researchers made another hypothesis as to why this might be, that it could be that these advisors did do a really good job of discovery initially with that client in year one. But what they don't necessarily, maybe didn't necessarily realize is that all of these different events that people can experience mm -hmm. will absolutely shift their perspective yeah. and shift what they believe are priorities for them. And maybe now they feel like, you know, my advisor just doesn't know me very well anymore, yeah. you know? So, um, so again, this is kind of the case for why it's so important that discovery doesn't just happen in year one, but that you are, cre and, and we're big believers in facilitating a framework for these discussions because people need help in figuring out, okay, how do I think about this? They need some structure. Because if you just say, how are things? Has anything yeah. changed? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Then people are going to be, I'm fine. You know, yeah. they're, you know, right. not much has changed because we're not providing them a structure to think more deeply about it. So, um, and if I may, when, when you say them and these people, you're referring to advisors, advisors. right? Or financial professionals. Yeah. Well, any sort of financial professional, really. Yes. Yes. Um, so this, I think, is true if you're in a counseling role, if you're in a coaching role, if you're giving financial literacy workshops and things like that. In in all of these cases, it's become very clear by research that in order for a person to be motivated to take action in their financial lives and, and adopt good strategies, they have to feel a personal connection to what they're learning, you yeah. know? And so if they can see how it's going to personally benefit them, they're going to be far more likely to actually take action. Yeah. On let's, but let's talk about that. Cause I know, you know, in researching this podcast here, Amy, I know you talk about how action follows emotion yeah. and <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek and, you know, and leading with why can you talk about how we can help people take action by really harnessing or recognizing those emotions? Yeah. Well, it's, it's hugely important that we're engaging the emotional brain yeah. in some way. Olympic, and yeah. when, and when an individual is, has the opportunity to really think about their own life and what's important and how do I want to design something that's going to be fulfilling for me, this brings up 
positive emotion. Positive yeah. emotions are are very powerful in terms of motivating people to take action. If you think about emotions, you know, you've got this spectrum. Spectrum, right? And on either end of the spectrum, people will feel an urgency <laughs> to take action if right. they are anxious. rock bottom or yeah, yeah. utter elation. Urgency. Yeah. But when people feel neutral about things, yeah. then typically there isn't any action that's yeah. taken. So this is really interesting, I think, to be aware of. You know, so many sales tactics are focused on finding the pain point. Um, and it is true. It like actually gets people to take a step forward. However, when you begin discussing the thing that they are nervous about, anxious yeah. about, have difficult feelings about, just the pure act of discussing it brings those anxiety levels down for them, even before any action is taking. And, yeah. the, and the problem with that is, is that when we're reducing that anxiety and stress, ah. suddenly we're removing the motivation the to urgency. take action. Yeah. Not that we should keep them scared, <laughs> right? <laughs> keep them scared. But just to be aware of if we can also help them to evoke positive emotions, then those positive emotions lead to sustainable behavior change. Uh, yes. So not only do we want to reduce the anxiety and stress that they're feeling, but we want to get them excited about yes. what's to come. Yes. And that's when you're actually going to see action. Take so let's place. put this in. Go ahead, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So I love that so much, Amy, and, and I'm sure you're you get the same questions and, and frustrations from advisors you guys work that you work with. The advisors that I work with are often like, "Okay, Julie, I can't get my clients or their families to engage to make this asset allocation change or to you know get into this insurance policy that I know they need, you know, whatever it might be," mm -hmm. and so. So often, it, and I want it, so I wanted to stop and make the point that what you're saying is so critical to helping advisors connect with their um, clients to get them to take action, mm -hmm. right? And it's connecting with the emotion, whether it's positive or negative and better yet positive. So I love, I just wanted to take a moment and highlight how what you just said is such a fabu fabulous path and um, answer, solution, if you will. Yeah, so when you're lead, when an advisor is kind of leading with a financial service yeah. or a financial <laughs> product, typically people like, why don't do I care? feel there's no um, emotional connection. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, there's no emotional connection. It doesn't uh, it doesn't cause an arousal of any kind and, like, and in fact and it's like our neocortex brain is the part of our brain that is trying to understand what you're talking about in terms of this financial analysis or this financial product and our neocortex brain that's not where our emotions reside therefore it's also not where motivation is built so um it i think uh it can be far more effective when an advisor learns how to directly connect a financial service or what whatever needs to be done a task a financial task to something personal in their life uh -huh. something that means something to them and it's really not hard to do no it, well, it, it, well, well how you, it might be say. really hard for their mind right because that's not how they've been taught to right they were not trained these things um in our kind of traditional yeah. financial planning curriculum and, but sorry with a little practice it's really not hard to connect those dots and, uh, and i think the other I'm when, sorry, Amy. It's okay. It's clearly it's clearly <laughs> something that we focus a lot on in in yes. our training too. Yeah, I, I, there's a little bit of passion going on here. I think for yeah. all of us, we're all like, <laughs> yay! Um, 
And I think too, to your point earlier, is in the the rediscovery, the reconnection and the re-upping, right? So if it's a year, two, three years later, and, and the person is like, oh, you should do this, and it's going to connect with that emotion, but that's an emotion or a value that shared with me three years ago, yeah. that may be a moot point now. Right. So we right. got to make sure that we're keeping up with the times on behalf of our clients. Right. Yeah. And so to that point, um, one of the things that we frequently recommend to our community of advisors that uses our tools and resources is that they be thinking about uh, revisiting values, clarification exercises, visioning exercises, either on, well, two things, one on a regular cadence. So maybe it's every two or three years, because a lot can happen in a year that shifts people's perspectives. Or be very aware when your client has experienced some big life transition. Yeah. You know, anytime they've experienced a life transition, that is an opportunity to come in and say, let's just relook at this because you just went through this career change or because, you know, you just um, lost a, a family member or something, you know, it's anything can really kind of shift what you believe your priorities are. So those are our opportunities to keep your eyes open for Absolutely. To say, let's just go back and revisit this. And does this still feel um, aligned or, or does it feel like it needs some modification now? Yeah. And I heard you speak, uh, Amy, about the values exercises. I know there's a lot of cookie cutter exercises out there. Yeah. Where you whittle down 50 cards down to 15, down to 10, down to five. Can you talk about, you know, how you think about these values exercises and helping people maybe choose their top five values? And they may not all be these philosophical type of, of, of yeah. values. Uh, this is like perfect timing because I literally yesterday did a whole webinar on how <laughs> to enhance your ability to uncover core values. And yeah. I think one of the critically important things to recognize is that typically we all have limited perspectives of what values are. And so, um, you know, I think we typically think of it as like principles and standards that we want to live up to. Right. Um, or we think of it as these high level um, things that we can't live without, like our family, our faith, our, you know, whatever it might be. These are my top community yeah. things, yeah. right? Um, or it might be things that like motivate you, like creativity motivates creativity. Yeah. or achievement motivates me. But in um, it also includes, which people don't think about too often, actually very specific things to that individual, actually what makes them very unique as well. So it can be people, places, and things that have mm. real value to that individual. Um, and it can be, uh, you know, activities and endeavors that they're passionate about, causes issues that they're passionate about. It, it really can um, open up uh, people's perspectives of what values should include. Mm -hmm. And the tricky part is that a lot of the exercises, cl uh, cl uh, values clarification exercises ends up really limiting the scope of values that you're talking about. So mm -hmm. for instance, um, the lists where you have you know, a couple hundred words and you narrow it down to 50 and then 25 yeah. and to 10, you know, usually those are focusing on those principles and standards, those, you know, motivating things, those kind of high level, it doesn't get specific for what is in that person's life. You're not going to have photography listed on there, which is one of my values. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm passionate about the photography world. Anyway, uh, and, um, and also those types of exercises le are, sus are susceptible to a lot of external influence. Uh -huh. So if you are an advisor and you're providing this exercise to your client, they may feel like they want to impress, impress you, you or think about like, what do you expect them to circle? Because, uh -huh. you know, you're paying attention 
Um, also, you know, they're next to their partner or spouse, mm -hmm. and they're going to get in trouble if they don't mark certain things. So sometimes with those external influences, you're not actually getting to something that feels True. emotional to mm -hmm. them. You know, it might mm -hmm. just be like, well, I'm supposed to put family right. and I'm mm -hmm. supposed to like put faith or, you know, whatever right. it might be. Um, so, so I think um, they are very valuable exercises. I think it's just important to be thinking about what types of values will this uncover uh -huh. and how can I do a combination of different types of value clarification so that I cover the gamut of the different types of values. So there's, you know, we offer um, a sequence of tools that help guide thought process. And we were pretty specific in um, wanting to make sure that it covered that gamut. So we have a number of different fun, quick exercises that ask open-ended questions. And essentially it helps the individual to look inward. Mm -hmm. Like who, who am I with? What am I doing when I feel joy? Or uh, when, when do I, what activities and endeavors am I engaged in when I get intrinsic reward? You know, mm. it feels good just to do this thing rather than I'm getting paid for it or I have some sort of extrinsic reward for it. It's an intrinsic. So by asking open-ended questions, you kind of strip away the um the opportunity for those extrinsic influences to come in out external influences coming in as well so you know just something to think about when you're deciding how you want to uncover values uh, se several of them kind of limit the scope mm -hmm. and maybe you look at a couple of different methods that help yeah. you to broaden that scope i love enough. that I love that. And do you think also that it's important for you, for us to share with advisors to then encourage advisors to sort of set the stage with their clients when they're having these conversations to say there are no right or wrong answers, right? These are very mm -hmm. personal. Um, and, and maybe if, you know, who knows maybe even have if there's two uh partners that are both you know very important for you to get to know maybe you go through the exercise process with them separately totally yeah i i often talk about working with couples as if you actually are working with three individuals so you have each couple each individual that has their own values, they're going to have personal goals, you know, maybe there are some career goals or some things that they're personally passionate about, they're each going to have their own, but then they're also going to have them as a couple. So they have values as a couple, they have goals as a couple, but mm -hmm. we're not, I think um, this has always been an interesting thing to me that um, it seems that there has been this like assumption that we want to get couples to we want to mush them together, together. So yeah. they have the same dream so that they have the same no. values and we make one plan for this yeah. couple. but really it's not um it's not respecting them as individuals yeah. and, and then you add the kids into the mix or their parents into the yeah. mix right mm -hmm. and then there's a whole nother uh level which is good right it's good yeah. And I just, I think you're going to increase the trust and commitment that you have from the clients if you show your curiosity, interest yes. in knowing each of them as individuals and yes. understanding each of them as individuals. Oh, love that. <laughs> All right. Let's move on here because I know one of the outcomes that you talk about in the true uh, wealth process is a decision-making framework that really empowers the client. Can you talk about that outcome and what that decision-making framework looks like, Amy? Yeah, well, it involves several components. And so the way that we designed our model, um, there's 
sequences of tools that you explore different topic areas. And each of these topic areas are important to kind of build the elements of this decision-making framework. So one of which is we explore their biography, their history, past yeah. experiences, what has shaped their current perspective, um, how did they develop some of their values and um, preferences that they have today. You learn about kind of what has influenced their habits and their behaviors as well. Um, so knowing and understanding a, that history helps you to understand who this person is, is. today. But, but more importantly, it helps them to understand themselves, themselves today because so much of our past experiences um, have just kind of melded into our subconscious brains. It influences our decisions on a regular mm -hmm. basis. It influences um, right. our behaviors, so yeah. but it's just so automatic yeah. that it's not in the conscious brain. We so don't examine it. Exploring yeah. that, we're helping them to be a lot more conscious about their own perspective, about their behaviors, so that they can be making mindful decisions along the way. When they have that clarity about their values and then, <clears throat> you know, what's most important to them, they stop comparing themselves to their neighbors or, mm. you know, their peers or something. And they begin to just focus on, wait a second, what's important to me yeah. and where am I into, you know, in comparison to my ideal and and so it again removes those external influences, which is allows them to be more happy with their life. Yeah. So biography is one, um, and that clarity around values and perspective is part of the decision making framework. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, the design of the vision of the ideal future. So yeah, that has to include those values. So you can see that they're they're there is an order in which you should be having this discussion. You s explore the past, past to understand the, the present, present and, the future. and then you start designing your future. Rory. I'm actually, I'm Rory. A present, <laughs> Amy, you just validated my presentation. I literally have a presentation oh. that was broken up to past, but, um, present, we, and future. Please. We, I'm sorry, we, <laughs> Julie and I have a presentation that really breaks it down. And we talk about it with a number of guests on the podcast, Amy, Ross, Marino. We talked to yeah. Emily about it. It was really talking yeah. about that past is that story and helping people tell that story. People want to talk about their story. They're going to let you know the events and the people that were part of that and what, what led them up to this point in time where they're talking to you about some type of financial issue. And mm -hmm. I always say the beauty of what we do, Amy, is helping them build that story of that future mm -hmm. and create the life that they want. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about how we can envision that, that future state and that future self to have them make better choices in the here and now to, to, to meet that future self that they're looking to, to be? Yeah, there is definitely a direct connection between the past and designing a future. And, um, and it can help you to save a lot of time and heartache if you, if, because otherwise without that consciousness of values, yeah. then they are susceptible to mimetic desire, which is, mm. um, what does that we, mean? Mimetic desire is, um, when we are observing others enjoying mm, keeping things, up with the Joneses, maybe, and then we believe that if we also have that thing, yeah. That will make us happy. Yeah. So this Young is, financial advisors are experiencing that, I think. Yeah. Well, social media is yeah. making yes. this problem a whole lot worse in our yeah. world. There's a lot of yeah. memes on social media. <laughs> yeah. So um, it is well worth the time and effort to kind of explore it. And let me say, it's actually quite fun for people to do too. Yeah. It's an enjoyable experience. This happens to be the area that I think advisors are most nervous about. Ah. Um, so you, so they have to work on their own confidence level in, in <laughs> talking about this with their, with their clients and, you know, having some sort of structure that you can rely on to have those discussions can help with your with the advisor's own nervousness Confidence. about it right and do you agree too and i'm i'm really interjecting again do you agree really quick though that it's 
it, it's helpful and in my opinion, um, critical for advisors to go through this themselves. Oh, a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So to have all of the exercises that, that they're encouraging and asking their clients to go through, they should go through first. Yeah. I, I mean, for a lot of reasons, one, right. of which you can, you can, um, experience for yeah. yourself, the kind of emotional benefits that come from this experience and, and the, the insights that you have and the intangible value, yeah. because we can look at, you know, in terms of financial strategies, we can look at the practical value that we provide to clients, but it's very difficult to recognize the intangible value yep, the feelings, that yep. they're also receiving, unless you experience it too. Then you're like, oh, wow, uh, this is what I'm giving to my clients. This right. is so cool. And it's more authentic. <laughs> yeah. Right? Don't you think, and I think too? It's and like, sincere. It's, um, it can be a very strong relationship building tool mm -hmm. to be able to say, Ooh, when I went through this exercise, <laughs> I had some pretty interesting insights. You know, you don't have to share your personal information with your clients, yeah. but I think it's it it just will increase their interest uh -huh. to hear yeah. you say, "Oh, I thought this was such an interesting exercise to go through myself." You know, and um, studies show that when you have that reciprocal engagement, trust elevates. elevates. Yes. So part of the hesitation that I think advisors have in this with exploring this area is because they think about kind of traditional therapy mm -hmm. yeah. and you know, therapy tends to be you're exploring past experiences in order to identify trauma mm -hmm. and then try to heal this trauma so that it's not causing dysfunction or, or you're trying to move maybe an individual who is dysfunctional to a functional place by helping to heal the trauma. Um, and negative so, connotation. Yeah. Right. And that seems scary. And I totally yeah. get it. We're not trying to be therapists, but right. we need to understand the, the reason why we're exploring biography is not to identify trauma. trauma. It's to identify you know, values and perspectives so that we can be mindful when moving, when, when designing a life in the future. So we're actually like taking a functional human being and we're helping them to, you know, reach that hierarchy of Maslow's, you know, we're, we're helping them to live a more extraordinary life. So the mm -hmm. purpose of exploring biography is different than when you would work with a therapist, you know, in, in that kind of professional setting. So I think if you, sh if you can shift your perspective, Mindset. on why we're doing it and what you're trying to get out of it, it can kind of maybe reduce yeah. the anxiety, anxiety. That the planner feels. For <laughs> so good. That well, well, let's talk about maybe some approaches here because Julie knows that in our presentation, I have the advice monster and I talk about Michael Bungay Stanger and how we can tame so that inner advice monster and become more of the curious curiosity monster, that question monster, and really coming in with a blank slate. I do improv, uh, Amy, oh, yeah. and in our, in our improv coaching, they always say, come into a scene with a blank slate. It's like being in a dark room. And you discover things together and it slowly illuminates that room. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about how really advice, you know, kills conversations <laughs> and what advisors can do to yeah. really become that more of that curiosity monster? Yeah. Uh, I have said that line in several of my presentations. <laughs> I wasn't the person who originally said it. Um, I heard it from Marty Kurtz, who's uh -huh. a a great mentor of mine, past FPA president, um, money, big money quotient supporter for many years. Anyway, he, and I think he got it from somewhere else, but it always brings like for advisors <laughs> who haven't heard that before, advice kills conversation. Yeah. And it gives like a deer in the headlights Panic. of look at first. And then it's kind of like, oh yeah, I mm -hmm. can kind of see why that might be because essentially when you jump in with advice too quickly, it's like saying I've heard enough. Yeah. yeah. I, and, I, and I, I don't care understand. about your perspective. Yeah. I'm going to tell you about me. Yeah. Right. I, 
I equate it to, to, to giving people unsolicited advice. If you take that like extreme, how you feel when someone gives you unsolicited advice, like that's what we kind of do when we only like slivers of, 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 uh, intelligence of, of a person. Yeah. And we, um, Oh, making of the assumptions. Things, yeah. And I'm not a fan. This is, I hear this often too, about how you, you should really ask for permission to give advice first. And frankly, that doesn't rub me the right way either. I mean, yeah. it doesn't that's take what, away that's the why fact they're there. That, it doesn't take away the fact that you've stopped listening. So in other words, like if somebody, an example of that would be like, oh, do you, can I give you a little advice or can yeah. I, can I share whatever? And it's like, I know myself, if I don't feel like I've shared the whole situation, I'm going to politely, or, you know, in my head, I'm going to think, no, I don't really want your advice, <laughs> but I've learned how to socially, yeah. you know, be in this Acrius. situation. And yeah. so I'll, I'll like, yes, you want me to say yes. So I'm going to say yes. But if you think about really allowing a person to talk themselves out, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, giving them the opportunity by saying, is there more? Tell me more about Tell that. More. Is there more you want to share until they, until they themselves get to the point <laughs> where they feel like there's nothing else I can. They're exhausted. <laughs> There's nothing else I can tell or I can think to tell you right now. They are literally going to say, right? Uh -huh. What do you think? Yeah. You know, they're going to ask, now I want to hear what you think of what I just told you. So if somebody talks, 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 eventually they're going to be like, what do you think? And that's right. your invitation. Yes. That's your invitation. Bingo. Yeah. So just awareness of jumping in too quickly really can disengage them from, even though they're being polite and they look <laughs> listening, there's probably a mental obstacle that has gone up and they're right. not as engaged uh -huh. or committed to whatever. Trusting. Be. Yeah. It, it really does um, do that. And there's a great book. I'm sure everybody knows nudge nudge. Yeah. Where they do talk about uh, a framework for providing advice in a way that keeps the client in an autonomous, supportive environment. In other words, they 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 are making the choice of the the option. You know, you if you lay out options and the pros and cons of those options, you are the collator of important information. They are the decision makers, and if they are able to choose the option they want they're going to be far yeah. more committed to actually implementing that strategy in the end i don't know that i've ever heard it articulated so well <laughs> like you just said <laughs> we are the co-leaders that is so cool and it and you can envision it right yeah. it puts a mental image in your brain Love that. I love it. I love it. All righty, Amy, this has been a blast. I know we're running out of Gosh. time here. Is there anything that you want to share with our audience? Right? <laughs> Is there anything you want to share with our audience that we didn't talk about? Oh, man. I, I mean, <laughs> are you kidding? We I need to do a part two. Yeah, yeah right? I can talk for ages two. and ages and ages. I um, This is really my favorite thing to do is just you know talk about this fascinating stuff, client right. behavior and I you agree. know what what really motivates people to take positive action in their own lives. Uh, I'm yeah. I check us out. Contact me. If <laughs> yeah. If someone wants to take action yeah. and learn more about money quotient, yeah. what's the best way to do so? Well, um, you can go to moneyquotient.com. Um, I'm on all the social medias. Uh, well, I'm mostly focused on LinkedIn really. Um, and I write blogs and stuff. So you can see kind of more um, on our website, moneyquotient.com. Um, there's a blog, uh, and there's even an article, a blog article called advice kills conversation where I talk <laughs> about that more. Um, but we do trainings and things. So if you are interested, if any advisor is interested in talking about their own practice, um, I'm happy to set up a, a getting acquainted meeting and, you know, I can, um, hear about, what's going well in your client experiences and can point you in the direction of some resources and also maybe share how our own money quotient tools might integrate into 
uh, your client meetings. So um, cool. reach out, reach I out. I love it. I and love we'll it see all. you at shift. Yes. Yeah. I'll be <laughs> doing a Wonderful. conference workshop. Wonderful. Yep. All righty. Thank you so we'll much, Julie. There. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So Bye. Good. All opinions expressed by Rob Santos and Rory Henry on this website podcast interview are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Arrowroot Family Office LLC or their parent company or affiliates and may have been previously disseminated on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by anyone as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of their opinions. Past performance is not indicative of future results.